Uh, hi everybody, I'm uh, Rob Delane, I'm uh, Director General of the Department of Agriculture and Food, or DAFWA as we call ourselves, uh, and it's uh, my pleasure to be both leading uh, improved innovativeness uh, within DAFWA, uh, but also to play some role in fostering improved innovation capacity uh, and the proliferation of innovative policies, strategies, uh, and a, a more agile and, and uh, faster moving forward thinking public service generally uh, to the extent that we can do that. To help with that, uh, we brought uh, one of the world's most foremost thinkers uh, on public sector innovation and agility uh, to Perth as part of DAFWA's visiting specialist program. Uh, Christian Basson, who's a director of MindLab, uh, in Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, a joint venture of, uh, of several ministries uh, in the Danish uh, public sector, uh, is a, literally a world uh, expert in this area. He's written books uh, on relevant subjects, uh, a very smart thinker and a very smart presenter. So we brought him here and in the, the approach that we take uh, here at DAFO is if we've got something that we think will be beneficial to the rest of the public sector, uh, then we will do our best to share that. Um, so Christian in his short visit uh, did a number of uh, presentations uh, within our department. Uh, he spoke to our executive team, uh, the broader senior leadership team, uh, ran a uh, a co-creation uh, design thinking workshop for our staff. Uh, we actually had him present to uh, some of our clients and stakeholders to talk about the sort of uh, approaches we were taking in the department. And then uh, we opened it up across the sector. Uh, he ran a very uh, impressive session uh, with uh, more than 20 directors, generals and CEOs. Uh, he did a great uh, uh, workshop uh, masterclass uh, for the not-for-profit not sector uh, uh, and then uh, with the Institute of Public Administration Australia uh, ran a, a bigger session for public servants and, uh, and policy staff more generally. I think uh, the feedback uh, from everyone uh, to us on Christian's visit was fantastic. Uh, very impressive, uh, very inspiring uh, particularly around uh, design thinking, a new approach where you deconstruct what's happening, uh, what people, what our citizens, what our clients uh, are experiencing uh, and, and try and work out where the pinch points are, where the pain points are, where the opportunities for improvement are. Um, and, and then also around co-creation uh, and the subsequent step co-production, where you actually uh, analyse and design and create solutions with citizens, with businesses, uh, with our clients and with our stakeholders rather than the very old fashioned public sector model where of course we develop things which will be wonderful for someone uh, and then we give it to them or we push it at them. And that sort of uh, thinking which and approach which is now quite commonplace in Europe is uh, something that Christian is expert in and it really resonated here in, in Perth. Um, so Christian's had a substantial impact. There are people in public sector agencies, including DAFWA, who are picking up on design thinking approaches, co-creation approaches, and are starting to work with their teams uh, and uh, develop capacity in their own areas. Uh, that's fantastic and of course MindLab is, is a, there are great works available on the internet. Uh, you search for MindLab you'll, uh, you'll find them. Uh, and uh, so then where to more broadly? Uh, well Christian's visit was part of our commitment to innovation capacity building generally uh, and then in November uh, there was the WA Public Sector Innovation Forum. Uh, 150 roughly uh, public servants from right across the sector came together, did some brilliant thinking and, and brilliant work. That, the output of that, the feedback from Christian's work, uh, we'll be integrating, uh, reporting to uh, uh, the Executive Coordinating Committee, a group of uh, sort of guiding uh, Directors General, uh, but to the Director General's group more generally when I talk to them uh, 
in the next few months. Uh, and then directors general and CEOs individually and collectively uh, will be working through how we're actually going to provide leadership and imprimatur uh, for the sort of capacity building and change which is possible, uh, necessary, uh, and uh, which can be created through collective action and imprimatur from uh, high-end organisations. So I think Christian's uh, work has been fantastic. We're enormously grateful for him. We'll be doing our best to get him back uh, uh, as soon as we can. Uh, and we'll be doing work to see if we can't build the design uh, thinking um, skills uh, into the public sector and that co-creation capacity so that it becomes, if you like, endemic. That will start to spawn the sort of innovation we need in each and every public sector organisation. Um, fantastic, thank you. Uh, enjoy the video clip of uh, Christian's presentations. I'm sure you'll get a lot out of it. Thank you. Uh, my name is Christian Bason. I'm the uh, director of uh, MindLab, a uh, innovation unit in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, we're part of a number of uh, ministries um, in the Danish government, fully funded by the Danish government. And our role is to uh, involve uh, citizens and businesses in uh, co-creating uh, new solutions for people and for society. We work uh, especially with uh, the Ministry of uh, Business, the Ministry of Employment, and in the future with the Ministry of uh, Education and the Ministry of Reform in Denmark. Uh, what we're seeing is a um, very turbulent environment these days for uh, public organizations and for public managers. Uh, we're seeing them uh, trying to navigate a uh, much more uh, complex world um, full of uh, conflicting objectives, full of uh, uh, change, uh, change such as increasing expectations from citizens and business to uh, how public services are created and delivered. Uh, we're seeing a rise in costs of uh, health care, of uh, social services, uh, we're seeing rapid technological change uh, that is both offering us new opportunities in government but also raises uh, costs of, uh, of service. Uh, we're seeing, of course, the uh, consequences of the uh, global financial crisis, uh, which means that uh, many governments are uh, applying austerity measures, cutting costs, cutting budgets, uh, and we're seeing a, uh, a future where government probably will not have uh, more money uh, again. So in this environment uh, of complexity, uh, how do we tackle it and how do we deal with uh, uh, what you can characterize as wicked problems? Uh, wicked problems are challenges and problems that are often uh, ideological and political, uh, and that's usually the nature of public services. Um, wicked problems are problems that uh, are characterized by uh, multiple causality. Uh, we don't always know as uh, policymakers uh, what's the relationship between cause and effect. And we don't know in advance uh, how to uh, know what will be the right solutions. Uh, there are often competing ideas about what could be solutions to tackle uh, wicked problems. And in this environment, the question, of course, is how do you even, in spite of that, innovate? How do you find new ideas that can be implemented to create value? Uh, and in this environment, uh, what we're finding at MindLab is that we probably need to take a, a more humble uh, approach to policymaking. By humility, uh, what I mean is that we have to uh, respect and understand and take the consequence of that the world out there is not a, uh, a ground zero. It is not a place uh, where nothing is going on and where our new policies, whether they be regulations, expenditure programs, uh, uh, new types of service delivery, uh, where they can just kind of do their job or work uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in an open uh, and uh, almost like a blank uh, context. Actually, uh, the world out there is, uh, is full of complexity. Uh, people, organizations, uh, businesses are busy doing things in their everyday lives. Uh, they are busy uh, pursuing their objectives. Uh, they have their own motivations, their own uh, agendas. And if we're going to be effective as policymakers, we have to understand how the policies that we design fit with the uh, reality that is out there. And how can they make a difference for businesses, for people, uh, for organizations that we want to uh, influence? And in this environment, uh, 
taking the consequence uh, of uh, humility uh, means to spend much more time on understanding uh, that reality. Uh, so uh, what I'll be speaking about uh, in this uh, presentation is how we uh, apply different methods both of understanding the world and knowing what's going on in the world and different methods of actually taking that knowledge and co-creating uh, new ideas, new solutions, new concepts uh, together with both with public servants across a number of agencies uh, but also uh, together with the end users, the businesses and the citizens that ultimately uh, will be impacted uh, by those policies. How do we work systematically with innovation in government? It's not because you know, we don't innovate. Actually, uh, any government organization uh, comes up with new ideas constantly uh, and they also uh, try to implement them. Uh, but to work systematically and professionally with innovation, uh, we have to build a uh, more conscious uh, innovation ecosystem uh, that can enable us to get more ideas, uh, better ideas, that are actually will work uh, for people in the real world. And uh, what characterizes an innovation ecosystem? Well, first of all, uh, we have to build a uh, consciousness about what innovation is. Uh, every profession, whether you're a doctor or you're a lawyer or you work in finance, every profession has a language. It has shared tools, shares, shared concepts, it has uh, theories about uh, what works, what doesn't work, uh, and that makes uh, the profession effective because we can communicate in shared concepts, within shared understandings. In the same way, innovation is actually a language. There are concepts, there are tools, there are theories about innovation, and we have to build a consciousness within our public sector organizations about what that means. So the first uh, part of the innovation ecosystem that senior managers, leaders in government must build is simply uh, the awareness, the consciousness uh, of the language of innovation. Uh, what are the methods, approaches, um, and uh, how, do we, how do we share that? Uh, that can be done through uh, uh, internal communication, it can be done through building uh, uh, strategies and action plans, and it can be done by beginning to also recruit uh, and develop people within the organization that actually uh, know how to work systematically with innovation. That brings me to the second uh, part of the uh, innovation ecosystem, which is capacity. Capacity is uh, uh, the ability uh, to uh, 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 develop organizations uh, that are more nimble, that are more agile, that have uh, uh, less of a hierarchy. Uh, capacity is around uh, building uh, uh, explicit strategies that explain how we will work with innovation in our organization and explicit strategies uh, that set out not just our objectives but uh, how will we innovate to get there. Uh, it is strategies that uh, determine our highest priorities for innovation and also allocates the resources to address them. Capacity is about culture. It's about what is right and what is wrong to do in our organization. It is about what are accepted uh, degrees of risk-taking. Uh, it is about uh, ways in which we meet with each other in our organization. It is a, uh, uh, culture is, uh, is about uh, uh, diversity and uh, the types of uh, skills we have in our organization. Um, good organizations invest in innovation capability. They invest in training and in skilling. The third uh, component of the innovation ecosystem uh, is uh, co-creation. And now I'll talk more about co-creation in, in, in a moment, but uh, overall co-creation is about the process of innovation. Uh, co-creation is about designing and developing uh, new solutions uh, together with people, not just for them or to them. Uh, co-creation is about a mindset that uh, balances involvement of your own organization, uh, your own system, uh, and involvement of the world uh, out there, the world that is certainly not a ground zero, but is full of actors, of interests, uh, of organizations, of people uh, that we have to involve to understand their worlds and try to uh, orchestrate a process where the world of government and the world of society uh, comes together uh, uh, to, uh, to tackle uh, these wicked problems we, we have. The fourth and uh, final part of the uh, four C's, the innovation ecosystem, is, uh, has got to do with leadership. Uh, it's, I call it courage. Uh, and uh, courage is about uh, the ability to balance on the one hand, uh, inspiring and visionary leadership, 
uh, leadership that is uh, uh, always uh, searching for new ideas on the one hand, uh, that is open to inputs and suggestions from uh, staff at all levels of the organization. But courage is also about execution. It is about uh, deciding uh, and executing on the best ideas and making them happen uh, to create value. Because ultimately, uh, the reason we need to build an innovation ecosystem, the reason we need to uh, both build uh, consciousness, capacity, co-creation uh, and courage within our organizations is because innovation is about the creation of value. Uh, and value in uh, public service organizations is both about higher productivity in these times of austerity. It's about a better service experience for people, for businesses that are the end users of our services. It is about uh, creating better outcomes such as more health, more learning, uh, more safety, uh, more growth, uh, more sustainability in our societies, for example. And finally, value uh, is about uh, enhancing our democracy, uh, equality, empowerment, uh, equal rights, uh, transparency and accountability, and so on. So the four C's of the innovation ecosystem is really about uh, changing and developing uh, public sector organizations into uh, what you might call innovation machines. Uh, organizations that can work professionally at all levels, consciously, uh, to create more value, which is of course why we uh, even are here. All right. So, co-creation uh, is about the process of innovation. And of course, there are many different methodologies and processes out there. Uh, but what I'll try to share with you is a, a generic way of uh, looking at, uh, thinking about, and certainly doing uh, innovation, which is about involving both uh, your own system, but certainly also uh, end users, uh, business people, uh, citizens, uh, and uh, other actors that uh, have knowledge and insight and experience to bring into the process. We believe very strongly at MindLab that uh, it is only through co-creation that you can get the uh, buy-in and the uh, um, contributions from your own organization that will ensure uh, that implementation can actually happen. And co-creation is also the only way in which you can get a systematic and deep understanding of uh, the world in which your ideas and solutions uh, need to come and work. Um, to start with, uh, let's take a look at uh, what does a sort of a generic design process look like. Uh, and the slide you're seeing uh, shows uh, how we need to move uh, in any innovation process uh, from the present uh, today and the concreteness and the actuality of the situation we have today through a process of abstraction where we begin to analyze and understand uh, what does uh, what's going on today mean for organization to the future where we synthesize new ideas and new concepts, uh, new visions about the future. And finally, to a new uh, situation, a new concrete uh, situation in the future where we actually have innovated, where we have changed, where we have actually moved from uh, the present situation to one that is better. That's the fundamental nature of the innovation process. That does not mean we cannot begin it or start it in different of the quadrants but it means that ultimately we need to move from one situation now to one in the future. That is, by the way, also how uh, Herbert Simon, uh, the late uh, Nobel Prize winner, de defines uh, design. Uh, he defines design as uh, the ability to uh, make up uh, plans and actions that will uh, change the current situation into a better one. The next slide shows the multiple number of uh, types of activities that we can undertake in all of these three uh, all these four uh, quadrants uh, from knowing the situation today uh, reframing problems uh, from uh, shifting up to uh, uh, analyzing and uh, doing pattern recognition and uh, understanding uh, the significance of our insights for organization and uh, moving all the way to uh, ideation uh, concept development prototyping uh, and back to, uh, to testing and uh, uh, scaling and uh, to, uh, to learning from the process. In my experience, uh, the most powerful place in the process is probably the knowing. It's about knowing the world in a much more qualitative, in-depth, rich way than we usually do in government. 
Uh, so knowing uh, is about what uh, I also characterize as uh, professional empathy. Uh, if we move to uh, the next slide, uh, you can see how uh, that whole part of the process is really about uh, diving into uh, the context and the practice of how uh, actual citizens, actual businesses uh, do their work. Uh, professional empathy uh, is, for example, about visiting uh, a number of uh, farmers uh, physically and spending time with them half a day or a whole day uh, video filming interviews with them about their experience with government red tape and bureaucracy uh, understanding uh, what are the tools that they use to manage uh, government regulation everything from uh, manual files to uh, IT systems uh, from work processes uh, and when does uh, what government does uh, seem meaningful and useful and sensible and when does what government does uh, seem uh, problematic, uh, frustrating, uh, irritating, uh, too slow, uh, and, um, and basically not helpful. Uh, so spending time and energy on understanding that context, uh, understanding uh, the experience, which is of course subjective, uh, but still uh, uh, actually the experience, is the starting point uh, of the process of co-creation. From professional empathy of really harvesting this kind of type of knowledge and doing it in a way where we can actually take video or audio uh, with us uh, back into the, into the office, back into the organization, uh, we need to begin to uh, rehearse the future. This is where design methodology really comes into play in terms of using uh, visualization. It can be also be graphical illustrations of a service journey through a system. It can be uh, video, it can be the audio. Uh, using it to tell the stories and the narratives uh, of real people about uh, what our services do and then beginning to uh, generate new um, uh, understandings of the significance of this. Uh, so begin to rehearse the future is first of all to identify what are the core problems that uh, uh, are happening out there and beginning to identify what we characterize as uh, what we call how might we questions. Uh, how might we question is a reaction to a problem. How might we question is, uh, is an indication that an organization is trying to find a direction, uh, trying to find a, a, a solution, set of solutions that will actually solve problems and challenges both for uh, end users but certainly also the problems and challenges we see in our, in our organization. So how might we uh, becomes the beginning uh, of a design process where we uh, brainstorm, we use various techniques to uh, generate more ideas uh, and in this process we really need to get uh, divergence. We need to get uh, crazy ideas, wild ideas uh, and to do that we often at MindLab involve uh, wild cards. So when we brainstorm we don't necessarily just involve uh, colleagues across uh, an agency or department but we do involve uh, artists, uh, people from private sector who work maybe in related areas uh, we involve end users uh, in the process uh, and we take them through a process of systematic brainstorming that leads to, of course, uh, a selection of ideas, a refinement of them in the beginning of writing up concepts. A concept uh, is a uh, rich, a detailed articulation of a uh, set of ideas, a coherent set of ideas uh, that include considerations such as uh, who, who will this idea serve, uh, what are the needs it addresses, uh, what are the resources needed, uh, what are the types of uh, barriers that might be, uh, what uh, kind of knowledge do we still need to understand the field better and develop a better concept, uh, what kind of resources will uh, really uh, be required in implementation, uh, who to take the main responsibility for implementation, uh, who should they collaborate with, uh, and so on. So developing a concept is beginning to get a, a joint uh, understanding of what is it going to take to take this idea into, uh, into practice. Then we prototype. And prototyping is a step of uh, transferring an idea into something that is tangible and moving through the design cycle uh, back into something that is more and more concrete. So what can a prototype be? A prototype uh, could be a uh, mock-up of a website. A prototype could be a uh, uh, narrative uh, about uh, the future. It could be a story about how the future uh, uh, should be. Uh, it could be a, a storyboard, a film storyboard with drawings that illustrate uh, exactly how might the story play out in the future. It could be a film about it. 
a, a um, it could be a scenario, a video scenario we build with uh, playing with uh, s small figures and uh, actors and simply doing a role play uh, like with uh, small uh, stick figures. It could be a full scale role playing where we actually play out scenes of the new service uh, across a number of, uh, of different uh, actors. Um, mm. A prototype could be a mock-up of a physical uh, space, of a uh, service center, uh, and of how it, that is going to work for people. Prototypes are not supposed to work. Prototypes, as part of the design process, are vehicles for learning. They're vehicles for trying out rough ideas and getting feedback from end users, from businesses, from people, uh, to how would that work for them in their lives? Uh, what is not working? Uh, what do we need to change and to refine? And it's about a co-design process where you actually have a dialogue about uh, how it should be, rather than uh, just a, a evaluating it a, a sort of in, a, in an abstract way. We can actually work on it together and collaboratively. Prototypes come before pilots. Prototypes happen in the lab, or they happen in small-scale interviews and interactions. Then, when we are reasonably sure that we've got a prototype that is beginning to work and that has been refined, then we can begin to take uh, our idea to, uh, to, for example, to a pilot. And we can, for example, do randomized control trials or other tests where we get quantitative feedback and, and really test what works for certain constituents. Then we can take it to, uh, uh, to broader scale uh, and we can begin to say, well, let's go at full scale implementation. Throughout this process, we learn. And throughout this process, we're still curious about how does this actually play out in what is not the ground zero, but what is actually a rich social context. And as you can see, uh, the design model is circular. It is iterative. It is one where we continue to learn, which means basically that implementation is never finished. And we'll never be you know, satisfied uh, with scaling, but actually continuously be concerned with how does this solution, how does this concept play out in the real world, and are ready to continuously improve on it and refine it. So uh, the process of co-creation needs to end with a uh, systems change. It needs to end with redefining not just uh, the concrete interactions uh, between citizens and users and the system, but it needs to end with a be beginning, a redefinition of the relations within a whole system. So for example, uh, how do we change the uh, uh, processes between agencies or the processes that go on between uh, non-governmental organizations and the public agency? How do we change the processes that happen between local government and perhaps state or national government? How do we change uh, the workings of the system around a solution so it actually uh, really makes a difference to people? So getting at scale usually requires that we don't just redesign uh, interactions vis-a-vis uh, -vis citizens, but actually requires we redesign interactions across a whole system. Co-creation can be done in a few weeks, but to get it implemented and get it at scale, sometimes it takes years. It's a process where we have to keep the vision and keep the intent alive. And so throughout a process of co-creation, even when it takes years, we have to remember uh, the insights and the experience of people using the video and the audio and the narratives to remind us why are we even doing this. We've worked with organizations that use the video of uh, how citizens experience their services as training material and as really a material that is used to help build a culture where we continuously remind ourselves in the organization why we need to innovate, why we need to co-create, and where we want to go. So one of the things that we're finding uh, in public organizations that want to uh, build an innovation ecosystem, that want to co-create, is that they really have to build an authorizing environment uh, for innovation. And what does that mean? And that certainly means that the senior management and the top executive takes responsibility for articulating why we should innovate and dedicates time and resources to it. It means that we create the places and the spaces, whether they're innovation units or they're physical spaces, uh, that are accessible. It means that we invest in people's capabilities. It means that we uh, embrace uh, error uh, when, when it's made, uh, it's mainly when it's smart error. Smart error is um, basically it's error that is uh, strategic, uh, where we tried something we didn't know how to do in advance, uh, where we did our best, 
uh, and where it just didn't work. Uh, it's where we did our best and where it didn't work in a small scale, where we prototyped it. Uh, that's smart error. A dumb error uh, is errors where we uh, should know better. It is where we make mistakes and fail at something where we actually uh, have knowledge, have the skills or have the expertise to do it right. Uh, so an authorizing environment is one that stimulates and facilitates smarter errors and that still, of course, uh, tries to eliminate uh, dumb error. Um, the last thing that I think we should uh, keep in mind when we talk about uh, innovation in government is that co-creation as a process tends to show us what a new business model for government might look like. Uh, so whenever we begin to involve end users, citizens, business in uh, design of new solutions, we discover that they actually have resources themselves, that they can contribute to our solutions, that they can contribute uh, not just with ideas uh, or with insights into their worlds, but actually they can be part of the solution. Uh, so the question becomes, how might government in a time where we don't have uh, the money and we don't have the resources to do everything ourselves for people, how can we produce public services with people? Uh, with organizations, with external stakeholders, uh, with partners. And a paradigm uh, to, that is, I think, you know, worth considering uh, for, uh, for the future model of governance is what we call co-production. And very briefly, uh, co-production is a paradigm uh, that sees government not just as an uh, authority uh, that uh, decides uh, for people, uh, but actually as an uh, organization that uh, uh, is a platform uh, for things to good things to happen. So from authority to platform means that basically uh, we are facilitating processes. Uh, we step maybe a little bit back and let actors in society do what they see uh, is best for them. It can be through personalized budgets, uh, it can uh, be uh, through uh, empowering people to draw up their own plans and for activities and investments. Uh, it can be uh, through designing uh, digital solutions uh, that uh, empower people to do the things that they need to do. And we also see co-production as a paradigm uh, where we fundamentally redefine uh, the relationship between government and people and citizens uh, from one where government tries to optimize and optimize what it's doing to beginning to redefine uh, what's even the fundamental mission. Uh, it could be redefining uh, from saying that government is teaching people uh, to uh, creating learning environments. It could be redefining from saying government optimizes a case management process to government helping you get a, a meaningful and thriving life as a family or as an individual. And finally, co-production is really a, a paradigm shift uh, that helps government think not about helping people but about investing in their skills and their capabilities to do the things they need to do. So together uh, co-production is a shift from uh, authority and optimizing and helping uh, to a platform, uh, to a redefining uh, and to investing. And that kind of paradigm shift has significant consequences for how we run government. Consequences for how we budget, consequences for how we plan, consequences for our skills, our professions, and how we think of ourselves as experts. In fact, and this will be my concluding remark, Businesses and citizens and organizations are usually experts in their own reality, own lives, and the role of government is to understand uh, that expertise, that knowledge, and bring that into play uh, with our political objectives so we create more meaningful services, more meaningful solutions that create value for people and for our society.